All right. Good afternoon, everyone. The Secretary General and World Bank Group President Jim Yong Kim visited Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh today, where they saw firsthand the conditions of hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees. Speaking at a press encounter in Cox's Bazaar, the Secretary General said that it is impossible to visit the camps without being heartbroken over the suffering of the Rohingya people. He said he had listened to terrible stories of massive violence, of killings, rape, torture, and houses or villages burnt. And he added that it is also terrible to see more than 900,000 people living in terrible circumstances. The Secretary General said that the solidarity expressed by the international community has not been translated into sufficient support to the Rohingya people of Myanmar in Bangladesh, with the nearly $1 billion appeal only 26% funded. The Secretary General said he was extremely grateful to World Bank President Kim for mobilizing the World Bank and said he expected the World Bank to announce an extremely important contribution to the Rohingya refugees and to the local community. During the day, the two toured what is now the world's largest refugee camp, hearing firsthand accounts of the violence these refugees had been subject to in Myanmar. Some described in vivid terms a climate of fear with military raids in their villages. One man explained how women in his family were raped and killed while he was hiding in the forest. Others outlined the continuing restrictions of freedom of movement and lack of access to services imposed on them by the government of Myanmar. The Secretary General and the World Bank Group President took particular care to spend time with women and girls who recounted stories of unspeakable violence against themselves and their families. The Secretary General and President Kim arrived in Dhaka on Sunday. On his arrival at the airport, the Secretary General said that this was going to be a visit of solidarity with the Rohingya refugees and with the people of Bangladesh, especially the local communities, who have shown so much generosity towards the refugees. Later in the morning on Sunday, the Secretary General and the World Bank Group President met with Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister of Bangladesh. The Se Secretary General and Dr. Kim assured the Prime Minister of closer collaboration between the two institutions under the leadership of the government to address the complex Rohingya crisis. This morning, we issued a note from the personal envoy of the Secretary General for Western Sahara, Horst Kohler. After visits to Algiers, Nouakchott, Rabuni, and Rabat, he paid a three-day visit to Western Sahara from the 20th of June to the 1st of July, which included meetings in Layoun, Smara, and Dakla. In his meetings, Mr. Kohler stressed the importance of making progress towards a just, lasting, and mutually agreeable political solution to the conflict, which will provide for the self-determination of the Sahrawi people. He underlined the need for a new spirit of realism and compromise. Such a solution, he stressed, would remove obstacles to more foreign direct investment and to the creation of growth and jobs in Western Sahara and the entire Maghreb region. The personal envoy was encouraged by the openness of all interlocutors to play a constructive role in the search for a solution to the conflict, including by building trust across the political divide. The full note is online. You will have seen a statement uh, we issued yesterday on Mali, in which the Secretary General condemned the attack perpetrated against the international forces in Gao, which left two civilians dead. Fifteen civilians, as well as some Barkhan personnel, were wounded in the attack. The Secretary General expresses his heartfelt condolences to the families of the victims, as well as to the Malian government, and wishes a speedy recovery to those injured. He also reiterates the determination of the United Nations to continue to support, together with international forces operating under relevant Security Council mandates, the tireless efforts of the Malian authorities and people towards the stabilization of their country. Over the weekend, we received reports that intense air and ground-based strikes continued in multiple areas in Syria's Dara governorate, resulting in the death and injury of civilians and the largest displacement in the area since the conflict began. Our humanitarian colleagues say that an estimated 270,000 people have been displaced. Estimates are subject to change as numbers continue to be verified and front lines shift. A United Nations cross-border convoy has been on standby at the Ramta border crossing since the 27th of June and will proceed as soon as the security situation allows. In response to the surge of internally displaced persons seeking protection at the Nasib Jaber border crossing, as of the 1st of July and in coordination with Jordanian authorities, the United Nations is providing aid to the Jordanian side of the crossing, which is then transported by Syrian NGOs to the Syrian side for distribution. Aid includes food, water, hygiene, and dignity kits, basic items, and mobile medical assistance and equipment. The United Nations and its humanitarian partners stand ready to respond to tens of thousands of displaced people at shelters and sites through the most direct routes as soon as access allows. The UN mission in Afghanistan condemned yesterday's attack in Jalalabad that killed at least 19 civilians 
and expressed its concern about a recent spate of incidents in which civilians have been killed in attacks on schools and medical centers. The architects of this appalling crime must be brought to justice, said Ingrid Hayden, the Secretary General's Deputy Special Representative for Afghanistan. You can find the full statement on UNAMA's website. I was asked earlier about the elections in Mexico. I can say the following. The Secretary General congratulates the people of Mexico for the civic exercise of participation in the largest elections that the country has celebrated. He expresses the readiness of the United Nations to work with the new administration, continuing a long-standing tradition of excellent cooperation between Mexico and the United Nations. The UN Refugee Agency today urged the Austrian Presidency of the European Union Council to unite European countries so they can deliver common policies that uphold the right to asylum. UNHCR also released a series of recommendations which include establishing a fair distribution mechanism across the EU in support of countries receiving a disproportionate number of asylum claims and a regional approach to make disembark disembarkation more predictable and manageable. Meanwhile, the agency today named American actor, director, and producer Ben Stiller as its latest goodwill ambassador. You can find more information about this online. The UN Migration Agency reports that over 200 migrants drowned over the past three days in the Mediterranean Sea. On Friday, 103 people died in a shipwreck north of Tripoli, which was caused by smugglers taking migrants to sea in unsafe vessels. And on Sunday, 100 people were reported missing after a small rubber boat capsized off al Khums, east of Tripoli. IOM staff is providing food and health services to the survivors. So far this year, the Libyan Coast Guard has returned some 10,000 people to shore from small vessels. And today, I'm delighted to welcome Bolivia and Chile to the honor roll. Their full payments to the regular budget take that total to 107. Muchas gracias, Bolivia y Chile. And I want to flag that next Monday, more than 2,000 government, business, and civil society leaders will participate in the high-level political forum on sustainable development. The theme this year is Transformation Towards Sustainable and Resilient Societies. The forum will go on until the 18th of July, and you can find the full program online. And this afternoon at 2 p.m., there will be a briefing here by Ambassador Olaf Skog, the permanent representative of Sweden to the United Nations and president of the Security Council for the month of July. He will be here to brief you on the Council's program of work for the month, which they agreed to just now. That's it for me. Uh, any questions? Yes. Sure. I wanted to ask you, I was trying to cover the um, Fifth Committee over the weekend. It was a little difficult, but I've seen articles saying that the budget has been approved and that the reforms are approved. And so I wanted to, I wanted to know uh, if, you, if that's true or if, in fact, there, neither one is approved. And if I've heard from people now that I'm back in the building, down in the Fifth Committee, that the Secretariat hasn't sent anyone down to say that there's a problem with the peacekeeping budget having expired on June 30th, as it seems to have done. Can you, can you, has the money, in fact, been approved? And if not, what is the Secretariat going to do about it? And what is the impact on actual peacekeepers? Well, what I can say is the Fifth Committee has reached an agreement on the overall level of peacekeeping operations budgets and allocations for each mission. Details of each budget were being considered yesterday, and the final budget figures for each mission will still be confirmed by the Secretariat. The General Assembly will adopt the budgets as soon as the Fifth Committee has reached agreement on the remaining issues on its agenda following the closing of the current session. So we do expect the payments uh, to be processed. I guess, okay. So how long would it take that the payments wouldn't be processed? And, and I guess my question is, I've heard from some people in the Africa group that the, 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 I guess if they haven't had a vote, what, how do you use this word that these numbers have been approved? Approved in what context? Approved in any uh, public uh, meeting? That by, by the committee. And uh, like I said, we're, we're waiting for the, the General Assembly states to agree. Can the committee approve things in meetings that are not public and are not on UN TV? That's a question to ask the Fifth Committee. But you're, so you just said it was approved, and I'm saying the, that there this was is the, no this public is the meeting. Information, this is the information we have from our General Assembly colleagues. Yes. And is it and the final, just one final question, because I was told that the reason that this peacekeeping budget has gone over the line is because the Secretariat said, don't approve peacekeeping unless you also approve GSDM and, and these reform proposals. So some people said it seemed kind of to put peacekeepers at risk in exchange for another desired outcome of the Secretary General, what would you say to that? What I would say is that, that the discussions were going on in the, over the weekend, and like I said, they had come to an agreement. On reform? On, on the peacekeeping budgets. Yes. Uh, so we saw that statement uh, from uh, about Mr. Horst Kohler's um, visit to Western Sahara. 
and I wonder whether uh, he has any plans for um, to return to negotiations for, for the parties. Uh, well, he's had his various talks. Uh, at this stage, there's nothing to announce, but he will evaluate following his discussions. He was, uh, as we pointed out in the note, uh, uh, pleased by the constructive attitude amongst uh, his various interlocutors. Yes. Joe. Sure. Um, did the subject of uh, the human rights, uh, alleged human rights violations <clears throat> in Bangladesh come up during the Secretary General's discussions with the uh, Bangladesh leadership? Uh, yes, the Secretary General speaks about human rights uh, in, in all the countries that he visits with all his interlocutors. Uh, I don't have anything specific to share on that, though. Uh, yes. A follow-up question on that. Um, with the meeting with the Prime Minister, did he also discuss... I mean, I know his focus is on the humanitarian situation and the Rohingya, but there is another crisis in Bangladesh, which is the political crisis uh, and big question marks about democracy and rule of law ahead of elections. Did he express his concern to the Prime Minister? Uh, I, don't, I don't have a full readout of his discussions with the, the Prime Minister. Uh, most of their discussions was about uh, the, the support that we're providing for the Rohingya. I'll check with Stefan whether there's anything further to share. Yes. Sure. On the, on the, the coverage from Bangladesh has uh, Sheikh Hasina saying once again that it's her intention to build an island further away on which to relocate Rohingya. And I was wondering, does, 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 what's the Secretary General's view of that, of sort of relocation of Ro Rohingya further away from, from the border? He, he commented on that in, in the press encounter that he just had. We've shared the transcript with you, so I just refer you to what he said there. Okay. And I wanted to ask you, in the, in the DRC... Um, the, the Virunga and another park that are both uh, World His Heritage uh, Sites, uh, the government has just announced that they will be uh, opening them up for oil drilling. And I wanted to know, what is the impact? What's the effect of something being a, a, a UN or UNESCO World Heritage Site? And also, does the UN have any, have any view of opening up these uh, you know, environmental treasures to oil drilling? Well, uh, obviously, we're aware of... of the rights of uh, the sovereign rights of governments uh, to their territory. At the same time, of course, we have concerns about World Heritage Sites, and I would refer you to UNESCO for their response. They'll have to evaluate the situation following this, uh, this report. Did the Secretary General get a letter from Cyprus, this permanent representative of Cyprus, about uh, alleged violations of its airspace by Turkey? And if so, what is his response to it? Uh, I'm not aware of that, but I'll check. Have a good afternoon, everyone.